We've been going through a study of the Gospel of John, but seeing as to how Thanksgiving is right around the corner, I figured what better opportunity to study what God's Word has to say about thankfulness and its effects. Especially because there is a danger in celebrating Thanksgiving wrongly. You see, Thanksgiving is all about what we, it, it's all about um, reflecting on the good gifts that God has given to us, which is great. But if our gratitude starts and stops with what we get out of God and not how we respond, how we manage the gifts that he gives to us, then our words of thankfulness aren't actually honoring to him, no matter how eloquent or enthusiastic they might be. In order to be truly thankful, we must first understand who God is and what implications that understanding has for those who would call themselves his followers. So today, my desire and my hope is to demonstrate from from God's word, what it looks like to steward his gifts in a manner that is pleasing to him. Our primary text will be the parable of the talents, which is found in Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. But before we read God's word together, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this lovely morning that you've created for us to enjoy and to gather together to worship you. It's humbling to be up here to to be the one to deliver your word to your people. So God, I ask that you would have mercy on me, that you would be the the force behind my language today, that my words would not be my own, but that I would be faithful in in rendering a right understanding of your word to your people. And I also ask that your spirit would be at work in all of our hearts, bringing us low to receive the message that you have for us today, and that that in your grace we we would respond appropriately to it, and that we would be faithful stewards in your name. So I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now before we dive into the parable, uh, just a little bit of background. Jesus taught this parable a matter of days before his crucifixion. He knew that he was soon going to be delivered up unto death and that he would return to heaven shortly thereafter. Therefore, it was essential that his followers knew what would be the signs of his eventual return and the expectation of their conduct in his immediate absence. And so it is that starting in Matthew 24, 14, Jesus spoke the following. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug a hole in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, You delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So, you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the man who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. These are the words of the Lord. To start breaking down the parable, 
Let's take some of the particulars into consideration. We have a master of great wealth who goes away on a long journey. When speaking of the master, Jesus is referring symbolically to himself. Then there are the three servants. These represent those who would claim to be his followers. The master has vast measures of wealth, described here as talents. That word talent is a unit of measuring weight, and in this context, it either refers to large amounts of silver or gold. Scholars have calculated that a single talent could have been worth roughly 15 to 16 years worth of a typical servant's wages. So for our understanding and application today, let's keep in mind that each of the servants was entrusted a significant portion of their master's wealth. They were each given a different measure, mind you, but each had enough that they could reasonably be able to turn a good profit in the service of their master, as was the expectation. Furthermore, verse 15 describes the master as having both intimate knowledge of the value of his property and intimate knowledge of his servants and their capabilities. So, the master goes away on his journey and leaves his servants behind to do as their office requires. They are bond servants, or slaves. The expectation is that they would manage their master's estate diligently and have something to show for themselves when he eventually came back. Well... When the master did come back, the first two were found to be faithful because they worked with what they had been given and increased the total value of the accounts. The third, however, buried his talent in the ground, blamed his slothfulness on his master, and was summarily stripped of what little dignity he may have had and cast into outer darkness, which here refers to hell. So what is the message that Jesus is conveying with this parable? The overarching theme is as follows. All who say that they know Jesus are given different measures of responsibility and opportunity. While Jesus is away, we are expected as his servants to be busy managing the gifts he gives us well, so that when he returns to settle accounts with us, he will see that we have been faithful in multiplying his possessions for his glory. This message applied to those who heard Jesus teach it in person, and it applies to every believer who has lived since then, including us. So our big question today should be something along the lines of, what must I do to hear my master say to me, well done, my good and faithful servant? Well, to answer that, we first have to figure out what talents our master has left for us to manage. Ephesians 2.10 gives us a very broad and succinct overview of our marching orders. Believers are God's God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Much like the master in the parable who knew his servants and their capabilities well, so our master has created us and prepared good works for us to walk in. God has carefully and sovereignly arranged the details of our lives so that, in whatever capacity of ability he has given to us, we would yield the fruit of righteousness by our good works, multiplying the goodness that God has extended to us. But the expectation isn't simply that we would walk in an outward show of good works. We are also told to do them with thankfulness in our hearts. Consider the words of Paul in Philippians 2. In verse 14, he writes, Do all things, referring here to good works, without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Now, what does Paul mean by grumbling or disputing? The term grumbling here refers to secret dissatisfaction, displeasure, or discontentment. In this context, grumbling would look like doing something that you know to be right, but being annoyed and ungrateful towards God that you have to do it. Looking at the term disputing in verse 14, this term comes from a Greek word that describes an internal dialogue. What this speaks to is an inner conversation where someone might perform a duty for God, but all the while they have this internal back and forth questioning whether he really knows what he's up to. Interestingly enough, the concepts of disputing and grumbling are found paired together elsewhere in Scripture, where they are used to describe the fundamental attitudes of unbelievers. 
In Romans 1, verses 18 through 21, we read, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Now listen to this. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to them. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Paul says that what can be known about God is plain to all, that his invisible attributes are clearly displayed to everyone who has ever lived. Believers and unbelievers alike can clearly know God in the sense that they can perceive him but what separates the two categories of people is how they respond to him. You see, an unbeliever may perceive God in some sense, but he will always dispute God's authority over his life. Like Romans says, the unbeliever does not honor God as God. The unbeliever possesses a heart that can't see God properly, so they will always dispute his character and dispute his ways. And because they don't honor him as God, they don't give thanks to him. They don't see God for who he is, which means they don't recognize their place under him. And so, rather than being earnestly grateful for every good thing that proceeds from his hand, they are ungrateful, thinking that they deserve better. By contrast, to be a believer is to recognize that God alone is to be worshipped above all things, and to humbly and gratefully receive the unearned gift of grace in Christ Jesus that is only available to us because of the overwhelming generosity and kindness of our Father. To put it in another way, the faithful servant of God recognizes his place beneath God and honors him as the final say over all matters in heaven and on earth and acknowledges that everything he gives us in this lifetime is a good gift that we are to receive by thanking him in our hearts. So with this in mind, Let's consider once more the verdict rendered unto each of the servants in the parable of the talents, starting with the first servant. Perhaps this servant represents someone along the lines of a Jonathan Edwards or Charles Spurgeon. He's given the heaviest weight of the talents. This man was entrusted with a significant amount, and because he knew his master and honored him as his master, he was grateful for what he had been given and was faithful in stewarding it well. So that when his master returned, he had made a significant return on the investment. Likewise, although the second servant had been given two talents and not five, he was still found faithful, like the first servant. Both of them had similar responses to their master upon his return. In verses 20 and 22 of Matthew, the two faithful servants begin by acknowledging their master and his rightful authority. They say, Master, you delivered to me what was yours. There was no grumbling or disputing. They accepted what was their master's good pleasure and right to entrust to them, and then they were diligent about managing it well. Because of their faithfulness, the master saw that they were useful and rewarded them by inviting them into his joy. However, the third servant was a totally different picture. Rather than humbly honoring his master as his master, as the ruler of his life, Rather than receiving his talent with gratitude and using it to bring increase to his master's estate, he had the audacity to bury it in the ground. And not only that, he blamed the master for his own slothfulness and wickedness. He accused his master of being a hard, cruel man, the type of man who claims things that he has no right to claim, and told him to just take back his one talent. And in his accusation against the master, he showed himself to be an enemy who did not, in fact, know the master. Now, he knew the master in the sense that he probably knew the guy's name and could probably pick him out of a lineup and probably knew why the master liked his home decorated a certain way, but he didn't know the master. This third servant is like the unbeliever in Romans 1, the type of man who can perceive the one who rules over all things but doesn't honor him as God or honor him as master. And so he isn't grateful. He's shown to be an enemy of the master. He's a fool with a darkened heart. In the parable, that's exactly how the master indicts this servant. He, he proves him to be a fool. 
If it's really as you say, that you know me well and know that I'm a hard master, you would have thrown my investment in the bank at the very least to collect some interest. The tragedy of the third servant is revealed in equal measure by his actions, the burying of the talent, and by his attitude toward the master, the accusation that he brings against his character. He had incorrect and harsh thoughts about his master, so he couldn't possibly be grateful for what he was given, let alone steward it well. No, he condemned his master in his heart as a cruel and harsh man, so in fear he buried what was given to him and proved to be an enemy of the master. Now, no one in the right mind sitting here today wants to be found to be like the third servant. We want to be commended by our master at his return, not rebuked and cast out. So since we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, when we meet Jesus, we must busy ourselves with the good works that he's equipped and called us to do. And to do that, we must know who our master is, honor him above all else, and be thankful for everything that he's given us. So in a moment, I'm going to get into the nitty-gritty of what it might look like for each of us to be a faithful and thankful steward. But first, let me reiterate the relationship between gratitude and obedient stewardship. Let's think about it in basic terms. Which of us has ever been grateful to get a new job and then showed up and did nothing while we were on the clock? Which of us has ever been grateful for a delicious meal and then threw it away before taking a bite? Which of us, in our profound and utter gratitude for our loved ones, spoke ill of them behind their back? The correct answer is a resounding, no one, thank you. We're, <laughs> we're following. So, no one, that's foolishness. Speaking well of our loved ones is the only appropriate response to being thankful for them, and being thankful for our loved ones is the only response appropriate to having them. Likewise, Eating your meal is the only appropriate response to being thankful for your meal. And being thankful for your meal is the only appropriate response to having food. So now consider gratitude as it relates to God. If you really know God, then you know that he is perfectly good, abounding in love, and liberal in dispensing his grace to us, unworthy sinners that we are. Even more than that, if you know God, you know that he only knows how to give good gifts. And so when you really know God, you can't not be thankful to him. As 1 Chronicles 16.34 puts it, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And so, when God's word tells us to do something, when it tells us to do everything, whether word or deed, in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him, it's not as if giving thanks is an extra or optional aspect of our obedience. Giving thanks is just the appropriate response to knowing God's character, and obeying him is the appropriate response to having the true thankfulness and love for him. Consider the following from James chapter 2. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Faith by itself, if it does not have works is dead. Similarly, what good is it if we say that we're grateful to be servants of the Most High God, but don't bother stewarding his property well? Let's read more from James. He says, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. The point is this. We prove ourselves to be thankful stewards of Christ by the way that we steward his good gifts. And we prove ourselves to be humble, faithful servants of our master when we do the work he's called us to with gladness in our hearts, giving thanks to him in all circumstances. So with that established, here's the question. Are we a thankful people? Put it another way. Will Jesus find us to be faithful stewards when he returns? Together, let's walk through some of the most common opportunities for stewardship or most common talents, if you will, that God entrusts to us. And between us and God, I want us each to consider whether our deeds indicate gratitude to him for trusting us with his possessions. So what has he given us? Let's start with marriage. Husbands, 
Are you thankful for your wife? Is it your joy to obey Ephesians 5.25? Do you love your wife in such a way that she need look no further than her own household to find a living, breathing manifestation of the love of Jesus himself? Do you lead your home with the best interests of your wife in mind? Are you thankful and content in drinking water only from the cistern that God has provided to you? Or do you go through the motions of spiritual headship and fidelity, all the while grumbling that God didn't give you someone more exciting, someone easier to love? Wives, do you joyfully submit to your husband as to the Lord? Are you grateful for the man that God has given to lead you and your family? Or do you disrespect and dishonor his headship and grumble about your duties to him? Husbands and wives, is your marriage characterized by Romans 12.10? Is it a competition where you each vie to outdo the other in showing honor and love? What about children? Has God blessed you with children? Do you teach them to fear the Lord and keep his commandments? Do your actions communicate to them that God and his ways are valuable enough to you to be worth grateful obedience? Or maybe you are a child looking at you up in the balcony. <laughs> so <laughs> I, don't know if, I, I don't know if there are any other children in here, but this is still important. You, you might be a child, so maybe you're not the one, the steward over someone else. You're not responsible for managing someone else but you're not off the hook either. You are still accountable to God for your actions and your attitude regarding your parents. Your responsibility is to obey your parents with gladness and thankfulness to him for placing them over you as they correct you and guide you. Now, what about your finances? Are you thankful for your money? Do you recognize it as provision from God? Do you use it as a means to bless other people, to provide for the needs of you and your family? And do you cheerfully and generously give it back to God to support the ministry of his local church? Or do you think yourself to be the source of your financial security, spending it on selfish gain and worthless trinkets? Or perhaps you give back to God, but all the while you do it with grumbling and disputing in your heart against him. What about your job? Are you thankful for your work? Do you do as Colossians 3.23 says? Do you put your heart into your work as if Jesus was your employer? Or do you slack off and excuse your laziness because your boss is a nuisance or because you'd rather be out pursuing your hobbies? And on that note, are you thankful for your free time? Do you spend your leisure hours to the glory of God resting in him? Do you use your downtime to nourish your soul so that you can be better strengthened to manage the challenges of your work week? Do you cultivate a mind and body that appreciates the beauty he's given for our enjoyment, whether it be in music, art, sports, or nature? Does the entertainment you consume meet the standards of Philippians 4.8? Are you filling your mind with things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and praiseworthy? Or do you opt instead for profane, idle, self-centered leisure that steers you in the opposite direction of the true lasting pleasures and relaxation that God has to offer? What about church? Are you thankful for this church? Do you obey Hebrews 13, 17, gladly submitting to the leadership of the pastors here who have been given by Jesus himself to shepherd your soul? Do you obey Romans 12, happily offering up your spiritual gifts for the benefit of this body of believers? Do you show up on Sunday mornings already prepared to rejoice with your brothers and sisters in the worship of our master? Do you invest in the lives of others so that you can stir each other up to good works as Hebrews 10, 24 tells us to do? Is personal holiness and righteous conduct a priority for you because you want to do as Colossians 3 says and use it to build up the believers that God has placed in your life? Or are you content to live how you want throughout the week, show up on Sundays, avoid making friends, and bury your talents in the ground because the church seems to be puttering along just fine off with uh, the, the, the efforts of everyone else? What about good theology? We live in an age of an unprecedented wealth of resources for correctly understanding and applying God's word. Do we gratefully receive the privilege by studying and engaging our intellects with his deep truths so that we would grow in a love and reverence for him that prompts greater acts of love for others? Or do we fill our heads with the deep knowledge and the deep mysteries of God and then become clanging symbols in our small groups and relationships because we prefer to be right rather than to love other people well. What about the gospel? Are you thankful for the gospel? 
In gratitude to God, do you have a sense of urgency to share the good news with other people who are on their way to perishing in their sins? Or do you treat the gospel like it's your personal ticket out of hell? Do you hide the offense and the beauty of the cross out of fear of how your friends might respond? Or perhaps you're here today and it seems like everyone else is given a pretty hefty measure of talents, but all that he's given you is unfulfilled desire. Has God given you unwanted singleness? Or is your marriage difficult? Are you unemployed or is your job grueling and thankless? Are you childless or are your children difficult and unruly? Maybe you're in the midst of suffering and you see it as offensive and ugly that God would dare to put you in charge of such a thing. Yet Philippians 1.29 would suggest that if that's our evaluation of suffering, we're reading the number on our scale backwards and upside down. Here's what the Apostle Paul has to say. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Think about that phrasing. It has been granted to us to suffer for the sake of Christ. When we think of granting something, it's typically in a positive context. A king grants clemency to an enemy of the state. A parent grants a child some extra time to do something fun before bedtime. An employer grants a raise for the benefit of a good worker. And out of the overflowing love of our master, we are granted measures of suffering. Oftentimes, with the greater measure of talents, there is a way to your burden, but also the opportunity to earn an exponential return on the glory and the riches of our master. Think about it this way. What does it say about the value of the one we serve if we do an average job of managing an average, easy life? How magnificent do we demonstrate our master to be when we accept his portions of suffering with gratitude, knowing that thankful, faithful obedience in the midst of them is his perfect will for our good and for his glory. Brothers and sisters, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Every circumstance, every sphere of influence, every possession that we have is a good gift given to us by our master receive with thankfulness and humility and to turn a profit on it for his glory. So how are we doing? How are we doing in stewarding our talents, the gifts of marriage, jobs, finances, friendships, and sufferings alike? Will Jesus commend us as faithful servants? If that question makes you uncomfortable, understand that I'm right there with you. I don't want you to walk away today with the impression that I just wanted to show up this morning and make all of you guys feel bad. Because <laughs> the reality is, by my old nature, I am one of the most self-centered and ungrateful people you're ever going to meet. In fact, one of my earliest memories was the time that I rejected a gift on my third birthday. At the time, I was obsessed with Star Wars, and so my family knew that I wanted nothing more but to get a, a lightsaber. And so my brother Liam, out of the kindness and generosity of his soon-to-be five-year-old heart, made good use of some duct tape and the remnants of uh, some of our other toys to build me a jury-rigged lightsaber. I will never forget how excited he was that week for me to open the gift that he made. And I'll never forget the way that his face dropped when I rejected it. You see, in, in my pride, I told him that his gift was dumb because I was so set in getting exactly what I wanted and what I pictured that I wasn't able to see the heart behind the gift. And I wish that I could say that I outgrew that horrible inclination shortly thereafter, but even this week in my sermon prep, my ungrateful heart has reared its ugly head on multiple occasions. At one point, when I was compiling my sermon notes at home, my dad came into the room with an arm full of sport coats for me to try on. Now you may not realize this, but my position here as the ministry assistant isn't uh, exactly looking like it's gonna make me a millionaire anytime soon. <laughs> so it was really thoughtful of him to see if he could share any part of his wardrobe with me to help me look at least somewhat presentable for the line of work that I do. <laughs> and yet, rather than being grateful, which is the only appropriate response, my immediate response was to be put out that he'd interrupt me in the middle of my work for something so trifling as a sports coat. Again, 
I showed myself to be the ungrateful wretch that I am. And in so doing, I dishonored my father's generosity and acted the part of an enemy of God, rejecting the generosity and kindness that my heavenly father was extending through the love of my earthly father. I am an ungrateful person, too prideful to accurately assess my own worth, and all too often I act accordingly. But I know that I'm not alone. I know that each of us is in the same boat. None of us is as thankful as we should be. So we often don't steward God's gifts the way that, he sh that we should. So how do we respond? Well, there's only two options, really. The first would be to imitate the third servant in the parable of the talents. We could give up and bury what we've got in the ground. In our pride, we could decide that God is a hard master. We could decide that God doesn't have a right to do as he pleases, and so we'll decide the role that we play in his picture, thank you very much. Maybe we could do a really good job of looking like a Christian, and we could just expect that Jesus will be happy enough when he returns to see that at least we didn't use our talents to support abortionists or to commit adultery or embezzle from the church. Or we can choose the second option. We can do as the faithful servants did and respond according to what was true of their master. So what is true of our master? Well, if we're believers, then we know that our master is the Lord Jesus Christ, God's dearly beloved son. He is truly God, the second member of the Trinity, perfect and good in all of his ways and holy beyond our comprehension. We know from Philippians 2.6 that though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And why was that last part necessary? You see, as uncomfortable as it might feel for us, as we consider how we're doing and stewarding our talents well or the lack thereof, we will never fully understand just how uncomfortable we should be. My sport coat illustration, whatever things you've been thinking about, maybe they might seem like a small trifling thing. Maybe it's a small thing to be ungrateful for it. But the fact that the blood of the Son of God was the only sacrifice sufficient to make up for that ingratitude towards God should tell us that in truth, God is more holy than we could ever imagine. And we are more wicked than we will ever know. That knowledge should humble us. Because out of the abundance of his goodness and grace while we were yet sinners, while we were yet ungrateful enemies of his kingdom, fools with darkened hearts who did not honor him as God, he loved us enough that he came to earth to be a servant, that out of his perfection and his joy, he'd endure the scorn of the cross so that we might have the forgiveness of our sins and the opportunity to be his true sons, true friends, true servants. That should humble us even more. He is not a hard master. His yoke is easy and his burden is light because the work of bearing God's wrath is already finished. And now the glad work of multiplying his riches can begin. He's earned and established the property and possessions. And now he has invited us onto his estate to manage his property well. Our responsibility is to simply respond appropriately to that truth. Let's receive the gift with humility and be thankful. Let's steward it well. Let's be obedient and diligent in managing our master's property, gladly studying his word to know his instructions. Let's not act like the pagans grumbling in our hearts or questioning his methods. When we understand who the master is, and we understand what he had to do to purchase us as his servants, we won't be found burying his talents in the ground. Because of the truth of the gospel, God has liberated us to be as the first two servants in the parable. Our attitude can be an attitude of humility and thankfulness. 
Lord Jesus, you have delivered unto me only the finest gifts, and I cannot wait for you to return and see what I did with them. Now, this was a, a bit that I, it's a little add-on that I was debating all week as to whether or not I would include it, but as I was praying through it last night, I decided that it was worth mentioning because it makes much of God. But I don't want you to receive this as if I'm trying to posture as some holier-than-thou hack. This is only a testimony of his work in creating a gratitude, a heart of gratitude within me. I'll try to be brief. I didn't expect to wake up one morning last summer to the news that my brother was found shot in his apartment. In the aftermath, it's been really tempting to give in to the attitude of the third servant, to decide that God is a cruel and hard master and that he doesn't deserve my thanks for giving me this peculiar, unexpected, unwanted weight. But the truth is, I can be, and still am, thankful that God allowed this evil to take place because I know my master, and because I know that he has brought glory to his son in the death of my brother. He is glorified by his perfect justice against sin. He settled accounts with my brother, and he will settle accounts with everyone who ever wronged my brother because I know my master to be perfectly loving and perfect love demands justice. I also know that my master is glorified by the outpouring of love as his Holy Spirit worked through you. My family was overwhelmed by the comfort and support that you showed to us in the aftermath through the prayers, the hugs, the listening ears, and the meals that you provided. I can be thankful for my brother's passing because through it, I got a clear glimpse of the faithful remnant that God has placed in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation that is so grateful for the comfort that they've received from him that they'd be willing to step into my grief and multiply and magnify the glory of our master by sharing his comforts with me. Let me sum it up this way. I know my master and I'm thankful for the privilege of being his slave because I know that what his enemies intend for evil, he intends for good. Even though I now bear a lifelong scar from the passing of my dearly beloved brother, I can be thankful knowing that I am now better equipped to show the love and comfort of my master to others. And I can be thankful because of how much more eagerly and gratefully I await the day when my master wipes the tears from my face and takes away my nightmares forever. I didn't cry last service. <laughs> Let me get through this. Brothers and sisters, in this lifetime, we are all placed as stewards over heartaches and tragedies. Yet on this side of the cross, we have the confident assurance that we can be grateful for our sufferings now and not be brought to shame, though the world and the flesh may tell us otherwise. Because in Christ, our sufferings only bring greater riches of glory to our master and to those who love him, who know him, and are thankful for him. I'm thankful for the passing of my brother, not because it's a testimony of my own awesome ability to be steadfast in adversity, but because it's the undeniable proof that there is a powerful God in heaven who gives good gifts of salvation, assurance, and gratitude that are undeniably from him because they can't be earned and they can't be stripped from his children even when the heaviest burdens of suffering are granted to them. If God can perform a powerful work of gratitude in my prideful heart, then he can perform a work of gratitude in anyone's heart. And so the application today is this. We all know that Thanksgiving is going to be upon us here shortly. And it's a holiday worth celebrating because it serves as a reminder to practice one of the most fundamental aspects of pleasing our master. But if we spend the day saying nice things and not acting on them, we dishonor God and we lie to ourselves. Likewise, if we do a great job of being thankful and obedient this week, but quickly forget who our master is and then stop acting accordingly, we miss the many opportunities that he's prepared for us to yield great returns of righteousness in our lives. So let this Thanksgiving serve its purpose. 
wherever you are in life, whether God has given you one talent or 100, be thankful and rejoice in your master and your savior. Savor your dinners. Laugh with your loved ones. And remember the shame of the cross. Remember that it was your master's joy to take your place on it. Let that knowledge inform you about who God is. And let your knowledge of God bring you low and make you humble. Let your humility be the root of your thankfulness. Then, take inventory of what measures of responsibility and opportunity your master has entrusted to you. This week, as with every week, let's dwell on what we have to be thankful for. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says that it is God's will for us in Christ Jesus to give thanks in all circumstances. So regardless of what portion God has given to us, let us all choose this Thanksgiving to remember who God is and what he has called us to. And let's be busy using whatever gifts God has given us to magnify and glorify our Savior because of the debt of gratitude and love that we have for him.